Tonight on Rescue 911, these true stories of extreme adversity and overwhelming love. Okay, you can help her little baby, okay? I was thinking I didn't want to do this. I was just a kid. I shouldn't be here delivering a baby. We prepared for this job and everything, but I never really knew what scared to death was until this happened. Sir, can you step out for a minute? Oh, 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 oh. It had been almost 10 years since I'd had CPR, but if he was going to have any kind of chance at all, I was going to have to give it to him. Even the most painful experiences can remind us what is truly important in life. We begin in Flower Mound, Texas, on the hot afternoon of July 23rd, 1993, as Phyllis Frazier returned home with her two sons, including two-year-old Dakota. It was up close to 100 degrees that day. My friend Kim was applying at some different colleges, and he had asked me to fill out a reference sheet on him. Did you bring it? Yeah, we got it set up right over here. Oh, yeah. We all sat down to do that real quick. Mommy, I want to go swimming. Okay, honey, we'll go in just a minute, all right? Every evening, we would swim with the kids for a couple of hours before dinner. I thought that he went into his bedroom to play with his brother. There was no concern at first. We felt safe, like everyone else does. He was gone a couple minutes before I missed him. Maybe yeah. shorten it just a little bit. That's Maybe when I asked Jay to please see if he could find him. Dakota? Mom! When we continue. It had been almost 10 years since I'd had CPR. But if he was going to have any kind of chance at all, I was going to have to give it to him. When Phyllis Frazier and her son Jay went looking for his little brother Dakota, Jay found the two-year-old boy floating face down in their backyard swimming pool. Mom! Come in the pool! When Jay screamed, my stomach tied up that very second. Oh my God! Oh my God! Dakota! Dakota! Oh my God! Uh, get him out! Get him out quick! Oh my God! He was bloated and he was blue. It was one of the most horrible things I'd ever seen. Trauma now one, what's your emergency? Um, we have a two-year-old boy that just now in the pool. Okay, is he is he conscious or breathing? We don't know. I just think he's like that. Have you pulled him out of the pool? Yeah, somebody has him outside. It had been almost ten years since I'd had CPR, but if he was going to have any kind of chance at all, I was going to have to give it to him. It was terrifying. Okay, he's outside. What I need you to do is go outside real quickly, find out if he's conscious and breathing, and come right back. Okay. Go do it now. Okay. While Flower Mound dispatcher Margot Eady handled the call, rescue units were sent to the scene. What I need you to do, is he still outside? Yes, he is. I need you, whoever is out there with him, to bring him to the phone or for you to take the phone to him. I had just completed the emergency medical dispatching course the night before. That was the first emergency medical call that I had received since taking the class and taking the test. You to bring him to the phone. Okay, do it now. The fire rescue unit was led by paramedic Robert Brooks. 
We were told while we were en route that the child was not breathing. When we have a six minute response time to the scene, his chances are not very good from the outset. Then you have to stack on top of that the time that he's underwater. And odds are now he's not going to survive at all. Phyllis's fiance, Jimmy Johnson, took over the call. Okay. Okay, sir. Go down there and turn the gear. We need you to bring him to the phone so I can help you do CPR. Do it now. I was very upset. It was very frightening to see Dakota in this condition. Okay. They're counting right now. Okay, put him on his back. On his back. Okay, I want you to take your hand, one hand, and place it under his neck and the other on his forehead. One hand under the neck and the other one on his forehead. Okay, pinch his nose closed. Pinch his nose closed. Put your mouth completely over his and blow twice. Two soft breaths. Two soft breaths. Do it two times. Okay, and see if his chest rises. Okay, now I want you to check his pulse. Check his pulse. Take two fingers, his two, first two fingers, find the Adam's apple. No pulse. Okay. We had been taught that this is to help people, but sometimes it just doesn't work out that way. I was definitely praying a lot in my head, you know, saying, please let this work. No pulse and no breathing? No. Give him two more breaths. Two more breaths, Phyllis. Two. Okay, now I want you, them to take the heel of one hand. The heel in one hand. And put it in the center of the breastbone between the nipples. Okay, tell her to do this. Okay. If she can't do it, you go do it. When I was in class, they told us to be very forceful but yet understanding with them to make them do what's needed to be done. I want you to push down five times. One and a half inches. That's what she's doing. Okay, do it five times. Count for her five times. I wasn't giving him a second chance alive. I was hanging on to the one he already had. And just keep repeating it. It was very difficult for me to work on Dakota. Okay, now start a cycle of one breath, then pump five times. My next step was just to keep encouraging them so they have a strength to draw from and they don't stop. Don't give up. Keep doing it. The ambulance is on the way. But it was the longest six minutes I'd ever lived through. One breath, five pumps. One breath, five pumps. It was a situation I had no control over. We could do CPR. We could pray. But it was in my hands. If she gets tired, you take over and start, okay? Gotcha. Is she still doing it? Yes. Okay. It looked very bad for Dakota. I love him a lot. Okay, keep going. Don't stop. Keep going. Keep going. Tell her to keep going. Keep going. Don't stop. Five pumps, one breath. Five pumps, one breath. Five pumps, one breath. Compress about one and a half inches down into the chest. Okay, the paramedics are here. Okay. Is, uh, have they taken over? They're, they're yeah, they oh, got him. Okay, they got him? They got him. Okay, you guys did a good job and good luck. Thank you. All righty. What you got? No respiration. Okay, give me the O2 kit. The child was not breathing, but I felt a heartbeat. All right, being set up. Okay. Looks like size about 120. They may go ahead and survive the incident, but now what quality of life are they going to have? We got an LZ? Got an LZ set up. All right, let's get ready to move. Are they going to be in a total vegetative state? Everybody wants them to start breathing on their own, their heart rate to pick up, and then get up and go run out in the front yard and start playing. Real world is that doesn't happen except in extremely rare instances. Dakota was transferred to a care flight helicopter and flown to Children's Medical Center of Dallas while Phyllis and Jimmy drove the 25 miles. It's one of the longest rides I've ever had in my life. I was crying. I was facing arriving at this hospital to find out whether my child was alive or dead. How are you doing with the airways? Let's go ahead. Two-year-old Dakota was examined by emergency physician Tom Abramo. The fact that Dakota had started having seizures was an indication that he may have had a significant injury to the brain. Heart rate's 143. And that he may not make it out of the emergency room. 
It was one of the hardest things I ever looked at in my life. In a way, he can kind of feel what you're doing. It was hard to believe that he was alive. It was like a dream, and I just knew I was going to wake up from it, but I didn't. It just got worse. In pediatric ICU, Dr. Brett Giroir took over Dakota's care. The fact that even several days into his course, he still had significant brain swelling gave me uh, a tremendous bad feeling in my gut that this beautiful child uh, was going to have a very severely bad outcome. I think the question is not just when will he wake up, but if he will wake up. We were in his room as much as they would let us, Many things rubbing his hands. We all told him we loved him and just waited for him to open his eyes. It is by far the most difficult thing um, I have ever been through. He might have a good outcome and might wake up and might be the Dakota you knew. I was very deeply concerned that we were saving Dakota's bodily functions but may have totally lost his brain. It's going to have to wait and see. I do believe that there can be outcomes worse than death. He had been in the hospital 10 days before he opened his eyes. I just expected him to be the same Dakota. But the accident took his brain function all the way back to prenatal state. He could not suck a bottle. He was not able to move any part of his body. He was showing severe signs of brain damage. I don't know what I did. But Dakota was put on this earth for a purpose, and he had not fulfilled his purpose yet. Thirteen months later, Dakota continues to undergo intensive therapy under the guidance of Dr. Frank McDonald. Your braces are fine. The determination that therapy takes is a 100% effort. In this case, I think we saw more than that on the parents' part. Both parents were totally selfless in, in helping uh, rehabilitate him. The day of Dakota's accident was the last day that I worked. I left my job, but if I have to give up five years of working in the outside world so that Dakota can have a normal life, then there's really not a question about it. Cognitively or learning, we're looking at normal levels now but he's about 14 months old in motor skills. But I know that he's gonna get there. He's determined and I'm determined. Roll over. I love my mommy. I do him fine. I like therapy. Did you kick it? He is a very gutsy little guy. It's amazing how far he's come from a child who couldn't lift his head off the mattress a year later to walking with a walker and help. It's, uh, it's amazing. There are so many people that I have to say thank you to, but thank you is just not enough. It never will be enough. The initial five minutes, ten minutes, are very critical to a patient's recovery. He is alive today because of the adequacy of resuscitation at the scene. I think there is certainly hope that he will be a totally normal child. But maybe he won't ever be a normal child in the sense of what we think is normal. But that doesn't mean he can't have a wonderful, meaningful life that's important to everyone around him. If you have a pool, put a fence around it, lock the gate, make sure your kids can't get into it. Put a simple little $200 alarm on your pool that tells you when something goes in it is one of the best investments you'll ever make. You have to protect your family because no one else is going to. <laughs> I think all parents should know CPR. Most of them will spend the money to go and take Lamaze classes. Lamaze won't help you near as much as what CPR does. It's more important than any other thing you'll ever do in your life or your child's life. Next. Okay, you can help her a little baby, okay? 
I was thinking I didn't want to do this. I was just a kid. I shouldn't be here delivering a baby. On September 23rd, 1994, in Blue Springs, Missouri, Christy King's fourth child was still not due for 12 more days. With her husband away on a short business trip, the Kings thought their three kids could help out around the house, never once expecting what a highly unusual problem they would be left to handle. It was two weeks before the baby was supposed to be born, and I thought it would happen when she was in the hospital or when my dad was there. Justin? Around 6 a.m., Christy sent her younger son to wake up the oldest of the King's three children, 12-year-old Randall. I tried to convince him to go back to bed because she had two false alarms, but he said, no, she's really hurting. I could tell she was in lots of pain, and it just blew my mind because usually she's the calm one, but she's the kid, and she's yelling and screaming while I had to be the adult. Blue Springs police dispatcher Brian Alexander was handling the call. It was a young boy on the other end, and in the background, the mother is screaming. I was nervous for the caller and for the woman. There's so many things that I was thinking of that could go wrong. The sack hadn't broke yet, and I was thinking, oh, man, this is for real. This is really happening. I just wanted my dad to be here or, or my grandma. I was just a kid. I shouldn't be here delivering a baby. I was trying to get an adult there. Maybe I could talk to to have him help but there were no adults in the house. Usually it's tough dealing with a child, but he was very calm. He kept me calm. He was using terms that I didn't think a 12-year-old boy should know about. He said that he could see her cervix, and I didn't know how he knew that. operator asked me to deliver the baby and I didn't want to do this because I might hurt the baby but I had to do it because I was the oldest and I my mom trusted me. Ten-year-old Johanna had taken over the call. It was just really scary because my dad wasn't there and my mom was crying and and I've never seen her cry before. Okay, you gotta calm down, okay? But nobody's here. I know they're out there, you okay? They'll be there in just a few minutes, all right? Just hurry up. Okay, you gotta calm down and listen to me, okay? I looked down and saw the baby's head and I saw her cheeks and eyes and mouth. I've never seen anything like it. And then its shoulders were sticking out and I didn't want to force it out, so I just and pulled it out a little more. Yeah. <laughs> 
Dispatcher told us to clean out the mouth and nose, and I was cleaning it off, and it was crying. But then it just stopped crying. When they told me the baby was blue, I got a big lump in my throat. I knew that brain damage could set in on a baby in minutes. I was trying to clean it out, and I tapped it on the back, and some water spewed out, and the baby took a big breath and cried a little, and I just was in shock. Within seven minutes, Officer Skip always got to the scene. Where's your mom at? My partner and myself immediately went up the stairs, and uh, we were greeted by the girl. And uh, she told us that, uh, you know, help the baby, help the baby. She said thank you and, and hung up. Inside. And I still didn't know at that time if the baby was breathing. I, I still didn't know. Hey, John, what do you have? Paramedic Andy Bow arrived soon after. Baby looked uh, a little blue, so started cleaning out the child's nose and mouth. Okay. You're doing good. Yeah. How are you doing? They got the child a little angry at us and got the blood flowing. Okay, we got the cord cut. You want to okay. hold the baby, hon? Yeah. Before... The baby was born, my mom was holding it, and it looked real good, and I was real happy. And I think how God helped us, because something could have went wrong, but nothing went wrong. The little 12-year-old boy, he kept saying, you know, I help mom, I help mom, and the little girls would say, yeah, me too, me too. And it was just great that it was kind of a family thing. I don't think that when I was 12 years old that I would want to take that responsibility. He did a great job. Seven-pound baby Brittany and her mother Christy were examined at a local hospital and found to be completely healthy. I told Randall that he was my hero, that I'm really proud of all of my children. They worked as a team, and they did great. They did great. Look at her. All right. See, I want to stand up. We had uh, planned to have the kids be in the birthing room with us when the baby was born. And uh, in order for them to do that, they had to take a siblings at birth class. They showed some pretty graphic pictures and, and showed a film of an actual birth. Well, they were kind of... Uh, giggly and stuff in, in a couple of parts, but uh, evidently paid pretty good attention. I don't think I could deliver the baby without the class or the dispatcher, or I would, would be clueless. Randall delivered it, and I was just real proud to see him do that and be brave enough. He's, he's young, but he did a really, really good job. Here's the booty. I was the first one to hold the baby, and it felt real good. I'd like to be an obstetrician. I want to deliver some more babies, because I think I'm pretty good at that. Oh. Clean, yeah. talking to really, really, really. There is a big special bond between all three of us, but it's really fun to have a sister, because you kind of get sick of boys if you have two brothers. I, got you. I like to hold Brittany, I like to give her kisses and pinch her little butt. I grew up on a bugger that I delivered you, do this for me. If it wasn't for me, I would, you wouldn't even be here. What? I love my sister a lot. Next. We prepared for this job and everything. I never really knew what scared to death was until this happened. Sir, can you step out for a minute? Though tragedy is uncommon, at any moment routine police work can take an unexpected turn, as partners Tom Blackshear and Gary Kaufman were reminded on the morning of October 10th, 1994 in Phoenix, Arizona. 
police work certainly makes us aware of our mortality and the mortality of our loved ones. It is in the back of your mind, but it has to be in the back of your mind or you couldn't function. Tom and Gary were checking out some of the businesses in the area and when they happened to be driving by a uh, rental storage business, they noticed a car and a couple of individuals that were acting very suspicious. Hey, Gary, go around the block. I want to take another look at that car. That was, didn't look right. When they came back around the block, the car was turned in the opposite direction, and Gary and Tom felt mm -hmm. that they had done so in order to keep them from seeing the license plate on the car. Let's we'll check them out. Let's check it. 774 Adam, code 6, West Indian School, a couple subjects. A code 6 means that the officer is going out for investigation. Usually it involves some type of suspicious activity. Sir, can you step out for a minute? What do we do, officer? Just need you to step out for a minute. We didn't do anything wrong. Fire Engine 18 was immediately sent to the scene, led by Captain Paramedic Charles Hood. Anytime you get a shooting, you're always geared up as far as working a traumatized patient. But with it being a police officer, that hits close to home. When we copy it shot, our wheels spin just a little bit faster. Officer Gary Kaufman's wife, Mary, a 911 operator, was on duty that morning. Oh, yeah. You think a police officer was police calling here. We saw two gentlemen running out of a storage unit shooting. Immediately, Gary flashes through. Where's, where's, my first thought was, where's Gary at? Okay, stand on line while I get officers calling, okay? Okay. Another girl was setting up next to me, and I said to her, Amy, find out where Gary and Tom are. Radio, this would be for North Chase, uh, incident number 1643. If she thinks there's been a shooting at 23 West Indian School Road. They put it out as a 999. We're going. Okay. Do you need more information from her? Uh, I think probably we've got it. Okay. Thanks. All right. I was so glad that they didn't need any information because my hands were shaking. Okay, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. We've already got a call in on this thing. Uh huh. Bye. Hey, Mary. She said, well, Gary and Tom are at a traffic stop at 23rd Avenue in Indian School. And I look at my screen. Tom! Tom was laying down by the fence, obviously hurt. Tom Blackshear was a 15-year veteran of the force. You gotta help me! Come on! My idea at the time wasn't even first aid. I just wanted to get away from these people. Come on! Keep talking! He's telling me, hey, I've been hit, my arm's burning, it's on fire, my arm really hurts. Gary, I left my gun over there. Where? My gun. All right. I'll get my gun. I never really knew what scared to death was until this happened. We prepare for this job and everything, but you never really think anybody's going to get hurt. Don't Keep talking! Don't Keep talking! Don't he was fading in and out of consciousness. He said, I feel like I might be hurt down here a little bit or something. On his left chest area. And so I looked down there and I could see his shirt was torn. It was like right by his pocket. Oh, be careful, my There was still a piece of the round stuck in the vest. Just keep talking to me, Tom. And the hole in his chest was like the size of a dime or a nickel. I knew he wouldn't die from an arm wound. But when I saw the hole in his chest, I knew that was very serious. Very serious. There were people there I haven't seen in three or four years. They were coming from everywhere. It was such a relief to see somebody that you knew. Uh, 
It was pretty chaotic. There were officers frantically waving us over. They hadn't caught these two suspects. So it's, it's a tense situation. Okay, deep breath, all right? You short of breath? No. Okay, let's get my that strip on off. Fire, my okay, arms okay, one more time, deep breath. Out of all the shootings I've ever had, I can't remember anyone actually wearing a vest, but there was a significant amount of trauma done, even with the vest on. Hey, open your eyes for me. For you too. Open your eyes, okay, side. He's been shot in the chest and once in the left arm. All right. <laughs> While officers searched the area for the suspects, Tom was taken to St. Joseph's Hospital and Medical Center, where he was treated by trauma surgeon Dale Stanton. The injury to his chest was a blunt type of injury from the impact of the bullet uh, hitting his vest. But fortunately, the wound was not sucking, so he had no penetration in the chest wall. Clear bilaterally. We need chest x-ray. If he had not been wearing his vest, he had a lethal injury. The chest wound would have penetrated his heart area. The vest saved his life. Tom's wife, Patricia, joined him as soon as she was notified of the shooting. He was in a tremendous amount of pain, especially in his arm. I was trying to find a place to touch him because his arm was bandaged, his chest was bandaged, and of course he had IVs and things all over him. But I was assured because he was talking, he was awake. I knew that he was all right. There is no substitute for the bulletproof vest. You don't have a second chance to go put it on. You either wearing it or you get hit. And I did it as kind of a last minute thing. Something told me to put the vest inside my shirt. That was the smartest thing I ever did in my life. Where did it hit you? I can't even describe the feeling when I got home that night and I have two little boys and a little girl. I love going to work. And I love the people I work with, but that was the one. Probably my question, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Three months later, 51-year-old Tom Blackshear has completely recovered and returned to work. Two suspects were subsequently arrested in connection with the shooting and are awaiting trial. The shooting was October 10th, and my birthday was October 11th. And I had the most wonderful birthday present. My husband was alive. See ya! Hi, you queen! It went around the rim. Tom and I do a lot of stuff together on and off the job both. We go golfing together all the time. We're good friends. I mean, you spend eight hours a day with a guy, you tell him your worst jokes, he still laughs. Two! I mean, I love the guy. What can you say? He's my partner. I trust him and he trusts me. What happened? <laughs> Television stinks. Now, primetime quality TV comes to daytime on fashion. On October 22, 1994, Arkansas State University at Jonesboro was having its homecoming celebration. At the last minute, freshman Colleen Baker decided to run in the 5K with her older sister. But before the day was over, they found themselves in a personal race against time of a very different sort. You ready for this? I'm ready. I was kind of nervous about it. It would be my first race. My dad has run in the Boston Marathon, and I was like, Dad, would you run beside me? And my dad, you know, agreed. He said, sure. Colleen's older sister, Bonnie, had been competing in races for six years. My dad was the inspiration to start running. I saw my dad do it, and then I wanted to do it, too. Twelve-year-old Stephanie Shearman and her mother, Pamela, were also running in the race with a friend. Six months ago. I love running. I run with my mom sometimes, and sometimes I just run by myself. Our relationship, I'm going through adolescence right now, and so it isn't that wonderful, but me and my mom, we talk a lot. With a stretch, so yeah, we stretch. Stephanie has always been mature. She was a mature two-year-old. 
She's a very strong person, can take on the world if she needs to. Okay, it's time to start the race. Runners to your mark. There will be two commands. On your mark, then the guns. On your mark. Stephanie has a lot of energy, and so she'll sprint ahead and run with some of the faster runners. Come on, B, let's go. And then she'll tire quickly. I don't think I can make it. And she'll run with me for a while. Do your breathing. And I usually finish last. I'm an ambulance chaser. You feel okay? Yeah. Okay. I remember throughout the race, this little girl, she would sprint ahead and then she would be walking and we would pass her. My sister was already gone. We were pretty far behind. I don't think I could go this fast. I would be like, Dad, I'm getting tired. <laughs> He'd be like, come on, you can do it, you know. I need water or something. <laughs> We were having a great time, you know, and he would make me forget how much pain my body was starting to feel. <laughs> Dad! Dad! At first I thought he just Dad! tripped. Dad, what's wrong? But what's then wrong? he had no response to me. Dad, talk to me! I couldn't believe it. You know, I just kept saying this is not happening. I had no idea what was the matter. I love my dad. And then he just stopped breathing. I thought he did just pass away um, in front of me, and, and there was nothing I could do. What happened to him? I don't know. We were running in a race, and he just fell. He just collapsed. Yes. Sir? He looked awful. Collapsed. It was like seeing death flash in front of me and I didn't want that to happen. Does anyone know CPR? His daughter, I guess, yelled out, does anybody know CPR? And I hesitated because I didn't want to jump in when another adult might know CPR. Please, someone help my dad. Are you okay? Are you okay? Does anyone know CPR? I do. Come on, Stephanie, let the officer handle it. And I yelled back to her, and I go, Mom, he's not doing anything. I was like, well, I've got to do something. So I sort of took charge. It was very scary. Quampa, got a runner down, need medical attention right now. My mother was doing the vital signs. Real weak. When I heard there was a pulse, I didn't do compressions because his heart was beating. There are so many thoughts that went through my mind. I'm not going to have a dad for Thanksgiving anymore. I'm not going to have a dad for Christmas anymore or for my birthday or his birthday. An Emerson ambulance crew working the race arrived within three minutes, led by paramedic Jeff Evans. Time is critical, mainly because the brain depends uh, highly upon oxygen. EMT Larry Baker had also responded. Most of our cardiacs won't make it. He's not breathing, Larry. Simply because but people don't know what to do. Or how old he is or anything? Without oxygen, a person starts going brain dead within four to six minutes. And he'd been running, so that would have cut that time considerably. Looks like we got V-fib on the monitor. There's a shock in. So you don't have a very good likelihood of getting them back. Charging, they clear. If you see anything like that, this guy was getting raised two inches off the ground. And I was, that spooked me. Part of me wanted to see if he was responding. clear? But every time I would look, you know, he would just still be on the ground. The victim's wife, Pat, had been waiting at the finish line. Oh, no, no, it just collapsed. When I first arrived on the scene, they just simply said that he had collapsed. Are you okay? Then I heard, we're losing him. 
And that's when I heard the paddles. I heard that sound. And that was the first point in time when I realized this is serious. When he started breathing on his own, I felt like he had a fighting chance, but that was all I felt like he had. After the race, I sort of broke down. It was, it was like, whoa. My dad's a drill sergeant, and he was more like, what are you crying for, Stephanie? There's no reason to cry. And I go, Dad, you don't understand. I breathed for that guy. 51-year-old John Baker was rushed to St. Bernard's Regional Medical Center. Wait, can we tell me love him, please? And I said, please, just let me tell my dad I love him. If he dies, I want him to know. I love you, Dad. You're going to be okay. Okay. I was praying that it wouldn't be, but I thought that might be the last time I'd see my dad. Uh, we have a 50-year-old white male who was running in a 5 Emergency physician Roland Hollis took over his care. Can you hear me? You squeeze my fingers here. He was totally comatose. His pupils were dilated, mentally reacted. He was posturing. Looks like he's posturing. These are signs of brain damage, or whether or not they're going to be transient or permanent. Uh, you know, time is going to tell. When I first got to see my dad, I just wanted to break down into tears, but one of my sister's friends said, you may not think that they can hear you, but they really can. And so I said, come on, Dad, you need to get up and finish the race. We need to go finish it, you know, and I wanted to break down into tears, but I knew I had to be strong. After three days, John began to come out of the coma. When he woke up, he smiled. It made the whole room bright. He just has a way of doing that. Shouldn't you be in school or something? He's like, he why like aren't you in done. school? <laughs> and we were, then I knew that he was going to be OK. Does that make you think of anybody? Two months have passed. John underwent a quadruple bypass for the heart disease doctors believe was largely hereditary. When they told me that I had actually had a cardiac arrest, I was very astonished. I was also very happy to realize that I was still alive. <laughs> if he hadn't have received early CPR, uh, his chances of survival would have been slim to none. That a 12-year-old girl had the presence of mind to begin a rescue breathing on him, and that, there's no doubt in my mind that saved his life. I was amazed that a 12-year-old had the knowledge and the willingness to, to stop and help. I was amazed that a 12-year-old had the knowledge and the willingness to, to stop and help. I just happened to be there, and it was just luck, I guess. We took Heimlich Maneuver and CPR in health class the week after, and I asked my health teacher, do I have to take this test? I think I already took mine. I'm so grateful for Stephanie for what she did. My dad used to say that I was his birthday present because I was born on the 28th and his was the 29th. I said, guess what, Dad? This year, you're my birthday present. Stephanie, she really is a hero. It doesn't matter what the outcome is, it's that courage to, to, to do something and to try to help other people. Stephanie came out of nowhere and said, I know CPR. I just think, you know, she's an angel, really, in disguise. I like the alive better. <laughs> That's a better pose. Knowing how to use the phone to call for help 
It's one of the most valuable lessons any parent can teach a child. If your community does not have 911, keep the emergency numbers posted near every telephone in the house and instruct your kids when and how to use them. This series is dedicated to all the men, women, and children who have the skills and courage to reach out to those in need. I'm William Shatner. Join us again next week for more true stories on Rescue 911. Next, Perk's Law is back. It's a star-studded murder mystery that will keep you guessing. Who done it? 90210's Kathleen Robertson, Melrose Place's Doug Savant, lots of stars and lots of shocking surprises. Burke's Law is next on CBS. Mr. Shapiro, step out of the car, please.